<laughs> it, it takes, takes a while to start yeah. very quickly. Ah, all right. All right, thanks. So, um, I will give you an overview of the theory of the beginning of the universe. Okay, so ambitious goals. <laughs> Uh, in particular, the theory of primordial density fluctuations, okay, the initial conditions of the universe. So, um, I guess that should be enough motivation to, to get you excited about the topic. Ah, okay. Ah, okay, that's well cool. Thanks. So, if that doesn't give you enough motivation, maybe it's related to EDS-CFT, what I'm going to talk about. If that doesn't give you enough motivation, let's see if I have something else for you. Um, well, I don't know. I hope uh, you're convinced. But uh, no, not kidding, I will spend probably the first lecture motivating the problem, setting the stage, and reviewing what we know. Okay? And then the second lecture, I will, I'll go very slowly through the observables that we actually understand, which are related to two points correlation functions. And then I'll pose the problem of going beyond the two-point function, which will be the focus of the lectures. Um, I am not organized. As you can see, these are the lecture notes, so I haven't typed them. Um, I hope I can at the very least send a scan <laughs> to you of, the, of these lecture notes. I think the handwriting should be neat enough that it's readable. And um, yeah, let, let's see how it goes. And I really want to talk about what I'm doing right now because it's like uh, keeping me like uh, like quite excited about the subject. So I'm hoping that the last lecture will be about like uh, current research, but I'll start slowly and I'll hopefully by the end of today we'll get to 2015, okay, or so. <laughs> and uh, so, all right, very good. So uh, the first part of this lecture will will really be motivating the problem so it, one thing is that the so it's all about primordial fluctuations the beginning of the u, the universe so the early universe is um, is interesting because maybe it's one of the unique places in which quantum mechanics and general relativity play an important role at the same time. And, and, of course, you say black holes, black holes. And, and, we can test the ideas. So this is cool, no? You have a chance of, uh, of testing quantum gravity in the sky. So that's nice. And the other thing is that the early universe is, we don't really know, but we think that the energy density, sorry, question? Okay. We think that the energy density of the very early universe was high, very high. Maybe the highest energy density that nature uh, gives us access to. So potentially very high. energy density and uh, if you don't work very hard this is a typical number the energy density uh, roughly speaking is controlled by the Hubble scale during inflation so that's what I'll have in mind in this lecture so there's some typical energy scale of the early universe uh, and if you don't work very hard, you will end up with a number that is something like this, 10 to the 13 GeV. So if you don't think about particle physics much, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, 1 billion or 10 billion, maybe 1 billion LHC. Okay. So if nature gives you a particle collider 1 billion times more energetic than the LHC, then your eyes should pop, right? Okay, so this is a possibility. Now, um, I will describe the scenario that we think uh, is the one responsible for these primordial fluctuations. And uh, it's called cosmic inflation. And it involves 
so cosmic inflation. This will be the working assumption of these lectures that the uh, early universe undergoes accelerated expansion. And uh, there, there are a few uh, energy scales that play a role. So let me just show a cartoon. So if I have energy scales here, and here is the Planck scale. Above Planck scale, who knows? But then uh, here, that's, uh, you know, zero. Then um, there are a few energy scales that uh, we think play an important role in the story. So I just want to show, flash them to you, and tell you how they connect to observations. So one for sure is this energy density uh, during inflation, this uh, H, that we don't know. Right now we don't know. Okay, So you don't. We would like to know. I'm just saying that if you don't work too hard and you're a simple-minded model builder, you end up with a very high energy scale. So we don't know how far these two guys are off from each other. But right here, uh, if it's there, then you're pretty damn close to the Planck scale. You're like six orders of magnitude away. So that's not, that's not too bad. Now, um, there are a couple more energy scales. So there's some scale here in between. We call F pi. Uh, some scale associated to, uh, there's some sort of fluid that uh, is responsible for inflation, it, and it has its own energy scale. And so this is another important energy scale. And then we think there are all sorts of other uh, energy scales that I'll just put them. So these ones, I would say a solid. They must be there in our models of the early universe. And then there are a few others that who knows. They're probably somewhere here in between. So just to just so that uh, you don't think that I'm just drawing like dashes on a board. So there are some observables associated to them. So for example, these two scales here uh, together they determine the amplitude of primordial density fluctuations. Okay. But what are primordial density fluctuations? Here we are, right? So uh, if you look back at the early universe. We learn a cosmology, everything is homogeneous, isotropic. If everything was homogeneous, isotropic, there wouldn't be planets, galaxies, people. Right? So there must be small ripples, small potential wells around which, like the plasma, the early universe plasma, like condenses and forms structure. So that's uh, what these primordial fluctuations are. The idea is that the universe undergoes this period of uh, accelerated expansion. It makes everything fairly homogeneous, like a very flat table. And that sets the stage for our existence. But then there are small bumps. And I'll show you quantum mechanics gives rise to them quite naturally. And these bumps are the ones that we're trying to study. Okay. So the typical amplitude of these density fluctuations is determined by some ratio between different scales. Then there are other scales here. Unfortunately, we don't quite know. We know that there's something between Hubble and zero. We don't quite know uh, how to, you know, to resolve this dashed region at the moment. But we have an observable that gives us a hint. And don't worry, I'll, I'll define these things. Uh, these are things that we have observed in the data, real data. Telescope goes in the sky and observes something about the fluctuations, and we read off these numbers. Okay? So this we have observed. And there are things that we would like to observe that will teach us more about these energy scales. So if you think of it as like an energy frontier type of person, you would like to go towards the Planck scale. So then, for example, uh, well, one uh, cartoon is that uh, th there will be some sort of features. There will be like a new, um, s like small corrections to the things we have already measured. Um, about the density fluctuations, and they will tell us about these different scales. So one of them are associated to 
they're called primordial features. So instead of having like, I don't know, some power law that describes the two-point function of density fluctuations, you have some small wiggle on top of the power law. So these are associated to features. Then the main focus of these lectures will be what people call primordial non-Gaussianity, which is a mouthful for probing interactions. Okay. So it's all about probing interactions of these primordial fluctuations. And finally, uh, we would like to measure primordial gravitational waves also, so tensor fluctuations. And tensor fluctuations uh, are cool, not just because, you, just because you're going to measure the, the distortion and rippling of the whole universe. That should be good enough. No? But other, uh, beyond that, it, measuring tensors uh, gives you this. Okay? So if you measure tensors, then uh, you will measure this uh, energy density uh, during inflation. And one, I, I won't say really a lot about tensors during these lectures, but I'll tell you that now we have bounds from observations. And we'll do better over the next decade or so by at least an order of magnitude. Either we'll see something or we'll get more stringent bounds. But, and if we see something, then you end up with a pretty high energy scale for inflation. So, that's, uh, so this is not a crazy scenario. People are willing to spend or their billion dollars or their billion you know, monies to, uh, to like, uh, probe this type of physics okay, with satellites and all sorts of stuff. Okay, so this is... So, Um, I'll tell you in a, in a bit. Uh, anything that probes the initial conditions, but I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how you measure each of these things. Are all these scales independent of each other? Or? Um, in a model, they'll be correlated, but uh, if you're, I always forget if it's bottom up or top down. If you're like model agnostic, then uh, your ability as a model builder of, uh, of separating these scales is on you. But uh, from the point of view of building like uh, effective description, they, are, they can be all over the place. Then you can argue about naturalness of the model and stuff like that. But uh, all you really know, you, let's put it this way. You solve the inverse problem. You parameterize the observables. In order to fit the data, you have some observables with certain power loss features. And then you'll fill up these... Uh, this, uh, uh, whatever, this arrow here. And then you need to figure out if you can stabilize all these scales and so on. Okay. For example, this is the challenge of uh, what people call string cosmology. Because you have the Hubble scale, you have the Planck scale, and you need to fit in like uh, three or four other scales here. You don't have a lot of wiggle room to stabilize all of the hierarchies you need to fit in. Susie so breaking scale, string scale, Kaluza Klein scale, Planck scale, all in like a, a certain range. So that's uh, that's on you as a model builder. But from a model agnostic perspective, they are independent. Yeah. Um, so that scale is for the input on the high rate. Uh, well, let's. Uh, I'm, I'm being uh, model agnostic at the moment. I'm just saying that there is a scale. Uh, with respect to, to which, uh, compared to the Hubble scale, controls the amplitude of density perturbations. So that's why I call it F-pi. I'm calling it the pi on. I don't know if this pi on is a fluctuation of the inflaton or what. Exactly. Um, and then if you had, like, say, visited the dimension of, like, including the time complexity, if you have other fields, uh, would, right. they, would they all sit at the same energy scale? So KK modes could be around here. They could, it, it's usually a tower, right? So they could, the question is where the tower begins. So it could start around here. And then uh, G, G string, for example, would be very, M string, sorry, would be very close to the Hubble scale. The mod, it's hard to control the model, but nothing, it's an interesting possibility. Uh, typically we want to move this up high and then uh, the KK scale is up here. It's harder to probe, but. Sorry. So a very really simple question from a experimental point of view, which is not my point of view. How, how are we sure that we can exclude new physics to a certain scale? So imagine we measure something up to a, a given scale x, 
And how can we, how, I mean, is it possible you are 100% sure that we're excluding new physics at up to the given scale x? Well, you only have access to certain observables, right? So the extent that those observables affect the scales of the problem, yes. Right, so why do we, why are we making sure that they have to be, the scale has to be above the f pi? Ah, that's just a question of controllability of the model. You're, you're, you build a model and then you want to claim that you can compute predictions reliably, right? So when you claim you compute predictions reliably, there is an error. And the error is controlled by ratios of energy scale. So that's why you want to. I mean, for example, uh, you could say, well, why isn't the string scale in string theory close to the Hubble scale? That would be great. You would look up in the sky and see like strings fly in the sky. People actually look for these. But it's very hard to control. Then you can't, uh, you don't know how to do the computation. Yeah, so, it's, so it's not something conceptually that we understand. It's just like because of some practicalities for some other building? Or oh, it's, it's practicality of you as a theorist to be able to tell an observationalist this is what you should look for. If you have a model that's like a, uh, that you compute the tree. It's like, um, say you want to do a Landau-Ginsburg theory for the Ising model in 3D, you compute the mean field theory. Answer, you say, yeah, that's it. Uh, it's wrong, right? Because yeah. you, you, you're neglecting stuff that is order one. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's all I mean. All right, so this is one motivation. Okay, so this is motivation number one. Then let me get to uh, motivation number two, and then I'll address the question of uh, how we observe these things. But actually, it's, it's a, there's a new theoretical challenge here. New theoretical challenge. Um, how did I write it? Okay, so you, you, you must compute and characterize at the level of phenomenology, pheno if you wish, the statistics of primordial fluctuation. So I'm going to draw you a cartoon that hopefully clarifies things a bit. OK, so here we are. I need color. Our planet, here we are, us. And then we observe, um, look up in the sky. We observe like galaxies. So these are my galaxies. I always mess them up. Uh, these are the galaxies. I mean, if you can observe like gravitational lensing, you even see that there's some sort of cosmic web made of dark matter and so on. So this looks randomly distributed, but you can study statistical questions. And this is, what I, this is where the observational meat of this program, program comes from. So for example, you will plot as a function of, say, wave number, you assume that there is a translation invariance. You compute the two-point correlation function of density fluctuations. Okay, so there is, uh, the, the question is, if I see a chunk of galaxies over here and I fix some distance in the sky, what's the, uh, what's the amplitude of the density fluctuations at fixed separation? Okay. So this is the type of question. Because of translation invariance, the momentum must add up to zero. So this, uh, people observe. Okay? They do measurements of galaxies, galaxy counts, and they got a plot. The plot looks roughly like this. So if you take a cosmology class, which uh, we want, you will learn how to interpret this plot here. It's the poor cousin of the CMB plots that you must have seen a million times. It's Right now, it's almost as important as CMB plots. And over the next decade, um, it might even overtake the statistical power constraint of the CMB. Just because there are lots of galaxies, lots of redshifts, it's like a kind of a tomogram of the universe. So the idea is that you observe the clustering of galaxies. You see that there is like a, a scale above which the, the clustering is very strong, okay, so meaning that if I 
you know, put a galaxy here. There's a typical M scale over which it's, uh, you're highly likely to find another galaxy. Then as you keep uh, reducing the distance, then the correlation goes down. It goes down with these wiggles. So there's all sorts of cool physics here. You learn about uh, radiation error, matter error, like baryon acoustic oscillations, dark matter, all sorts of stuff uh, about the universe you learn by decoding this curve. So this is one source of information. Then another source of information is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So when the universe was 380,000 years old, give or take, there was this plasma, this plasma of photons that decouples, the universe cools down, and then they more or less free stream to us, and we get the snapshot of the very early universe. And then again, it looks very, very homogeneous, but there are tiny temperature fluctuations. So you can again ask this type of statistical question. Now this is really a snapshot. So if you wish, you only have access to the celestial sphere. Okay. So this is celestial holography. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's kind of like celestial holography because you really have access to just this uh, snapshot of the universe. And then you want to understand what gave rise to it. Here you compute a temperature two-point function. So there are uh, cold and hot spots as a function. Because it's, a, it's just one snapshot on the sphere, you typically talk about uh, multipoles. And this you probably have seen from the Planck satellite. So it starts fairly flat, and then it goes up, and then it goes down, and there's a tail, and so on. So you can read of all sorts of cool physics about the heights of the peaks, the amount of dark matter, baryonic matter. There is a damping tail. Uh, but for us, importantly, there is this part here. So this is low L. Low L is very wide angular separation in the sky. So meaning you're looking at correlations over very long distances. But the universe is young at 380,000 years. So here, this part of the plot, you're literally looking at the beginning of the universe without any uh, later effects. You see, all of this stuff at shorter scales, the universe, it's like you're seeing dynamics since the hot Big Bang. These uh, plasma waves here, like you put, imagine you have like a hot plasma and you put this in homogeneities. Not my analogy, there's a famous physicist called Ichiro Komatsu, he says, is like a soup, miso soup. You put these blocks of miso, and then you see the soup like uh, rippling up and down. And uh, this is what is acoustic. If you Fourier transform these uh, ripples, you get these uh, plots here. But then at large sep angular separations, there hasn't been enough time in the age of the universe for the correlation, correlations imprinted at the beginning to uh, be modified. So here you really see the beginning of the universe. Okay? So now if you go all the way to t equals 0 in hot Big Bang cosmology, so here we, we re really observe, okay, so this is time. Here we have some model. And then here's where we stop. Okay, so this would be t equals 0 in hot Big Bang. But then you need some gravitational potential to, to, some, uh, to create these, uh, these uh, ripples in space-time. And uh, the crazy thing is that you need very simple initial conditions. So if you study, and I'll define these things in a second, if you study the two-point correlation function of roughly the gravitational potential, let me rescale it by k cubed as a function of of wave number, it's almost flat, almost. There is very small tendency for uh, these guys to be less correlated at short distances versus large distances. Okay, So very simple initial conditions at the beginning of the universe explain the data. So that's the, and that's uh, as far as I'll go <laughs> in terms of observations in this lecture, so don't worry. Okay. Um, so the two numbers that I show here that have been observed, AS and NS minus 1, 
are related to the height of this plateau and the, in, the, the slope, if you wish. Okay? So this slope here is related to ns minus 1. And it's too small. Okay. So that's it. So with two numbers, you can characterize the initial conditions and explain the data. Of course, that raises a huge puzzle, which is how come there are correlations over long distances in the sky at the beginning of the universe? It looks a causal. Who ordered that? And, okay, so that, that's where this cosmic inflation story comes in. It's kind of uh, fascinating because it wasn't developed to solve this problem, but it solves this problem with flying colors, and it's really where all the observational meat of the business is. So inflation is uh, some the Sitter era and so on, but it's very hard to actually observe the background evolution. You can really only go all the way back to this uh, time. Even with uh, modeling, you need some modeling here, but we think it's uh, well understood physics. To the extent that you add dark matter and so on. You don't really know what dark matter is, but as far as uh, these things are concerned, just the fluid that you add to the description of the system and things work. But then, if you want to go further, then you're in trouble. But we need to, in order to understand causally where these fluctuations come from. So then, the, to complete the plot, so the idea is that actually this is not the beginning of the universe. There was some earlier, earlier phase of accelerated expansion. And then who knows what happened back here, down here, how it started and so on. We can only look back a certain uh, amount of time, even in this picture of what we think happened. But OK, at least we can explain causally where these fluctuations come from. Because now, if the universe is expanding, it's like a vacuum, like a vacuum type of fluctuation. You have a pair of particles, and they get stretched by the expansion of space-time. And then they create this diagram. Okay? I hope that the... I don't know if it looks uh, continuous. It's supposed to be one arch. Okay? So that's the... Um, so that's the story. Okay? So that's the story of uh, how, how we think the primordial fluctuations come from. And the nice thing is that... Um, well, from ads CFT, it shouldn't surprise you that this almost scaling variance comes for free because of the fact that this background is quasi the sitter. Okay? So the, the fact that you know, might know from ads CFT that boundary correlators are like power loss is, uh, is necessary to get these almost scaling variants density fluctuations here. Okay? So that's more or less all we know from the data. So you asked, well, you asked, how do we measure these things? So we measure these things by either measuring the CMB or galaxies better. We measure the light has polarization, not just temperature. We measure the polarization better. We measure uh, the galaxies a deeper redshift. So we have a spectroscopic surveys. So you throw everything you have at trying to get more data because these things they really trace the initial conditions. So there are two challenges. One, to measure things better. One is to be able to run back the clock to t equals zero. Okay? And that's, uh, that's where, uh, these are the two challenges. Some of the measurements are so good that we are constrained by the fact that we have only one universe. So we measured everything there is to measure. There's only one realization of the universe. So there's some intrinsic error bar that you can't overcome. So, for example, if you want to measure the statistics of the CMB at large angular scales, you're more or less done because uh, you measured all the modes there are to measure. So the only way to do better is to go at shorter and shorter angular scales. Okay? So I was a bit weird, but I'm, I understand the motivation because you want to look at t equal to zero for energies and so on. But what happens, I mean, how is the physics at late time influenced by all this physics that you could encounter at the beginning? Is it like some independent like is some physics at very late time and because also there you have some you know possibly black hole operating at very long time and often radiation is also related to some quantum gravity effects so <coughs> maybe the density the primordial density is related to what happens after very late times so well uh, 
the universe is old, but actually for these things, not that old. In, in fact, if you, um, if you look at a particular point and, and uh, you draw like a, a big enough circle around it, but not the size of the universe, you can prove that dark matter doesn't move more than that length in, throughout the whole age of the universe. So for many things, the universe is quasi-static, which is the reason why we can very real, cleanly extract predictions from the CMB, because the universe undergoes evolution for 300,000 years or so, but it's almost linear physics. There is a very simple transfer function that allows you to connect the initial conditions directly to the observations. So in an analogy, here it's like uh, quantum electrodynamics. It's almost linear physics. If you understand like three level diagrams, you can map this observable to what happened at t equals zero. Here it's harder because the universe uh, is older. There's stuff clustering already. It's like QCD, the universe formed jets. But people are still able to, uh, you know, uh, find uh, include, uh, 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 observables that are robust and can, they can run back the clock reliably and still learn about the, the statistics of density fluctuations. I, I didn't quite understand your comment about black holes, but... Uh, well, I mean, also very, very late time for the prediction of the essay quote-unquote, end of the universe, and ah. things, and very, very late time after... The right, but, but for that, uh, it's just that much later, the universe starts to be dominated by the Sitter phase. We are in the Sitter phase right now, yeah. but it's completely independent of this one, right? So, I mean, this is the question. So, if some physics at the beginning actually implies that some... The Sitter phase maybe finishes and then there's... That, that, yeah, people, of course, speculate about this, but uh, there, there's no concrete... Um, Okay, there's, okay, suppose there's something like DS CFT. Yeah. Uh, then you trigger some RG flow in the CFT. You would say that it relates to two different decider phases of the universe. But uh, in regards to the late time decider phase, it's very hard to even know what the right question to ask is. Here, it's really, and that's, that was my point about the theoretical challenge. Here, it's really holographic. We observe from above some earlier the Sitter era, and we observe like this whole slice. So then it makes sense to, to ask type of uh, holographic question. So uh, while if you are an observer living through this era, it's not exactly clear what you should compute. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a, an open question on its own. What is it that an observer that lives through the Sitter, you're surrounded by a cosmic horizon, Okay, you can throw rocks at it, you will like bob and like uh, contract, expand, but it's not clear you can study scattering or, or... well here it's um, the word that people use is like meta observables. We are observing from far uh, in the future into this earlier era and we have like a ample view, like many horizon regions that an observer living through the era wouldn't have access to. Because the original the question was about for this quintessence model, which maybe you can assume that the UV theory has some construction, which can actually have some lambda, which is varying over time, and then it gives you, maybe, you know, goes down the right. equal to zero. This right. Also, in string theory, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but then, uh, the, the theoretical challenge that I'm trying to point out here is independent of this. So, what, you, what you're saying is that, okay, there, there are two decider errors, right? So, there's this error, we think, and now we know that uh, we are undergoing very slow reacceleration, right? The, the past billion years, very, very slow. So we are uh, at a much slower pace than back here. Now the question is, are these two phenomena related? It's a natural question. Uh, I just don't know how to check, how to test. Because here, while here you can measure the statistics of fluctuation, so you can ask like, statistical questions, you have maps and so on. Here, we've only measured one number, the, the Hubble. Uh, uh, maybe in the future, we'll be able to measure some e equation of states for the fluid, but we, we, we get one, two numbers. We don't get like a statistical distribution or anything like that. So it's very hard to test, I think, the idea. But it's a natural, natural question. I just don't have uh, something very useful to say, I think. Okay, so that's, uh, I hope, uh, addresses your question of how we... There is one last thing that uh, I can't resist, 
which is there is a holy grail of cosmology, which is, okay, there's the CMB, and galaxies start forming, I don't know, a few billion years ago, but then there's a whole dark age of the universe in which there's essentially only neutral hydrogen, okay? And we know zero, essentially, about the universe during this era. And um, the photons of the CMB, as they get to us, sometimes they get absorbed by this neutral hydrogen and re-emitted. So this gas kind of traces the initial conditions again. So if we could measure this gas, so imagine there's a whole lab before galaxies form. It's a whole lab of hydrogen, many redshift beams. And it's tracing the same initial conditions. Okay? It's almost linear physics again, like the CMB. This, if you just count the number of pixels that it gives you, it's like um, maybe a million CMBs worth of data. Okay? So this is an insane amount of data. And the only problem is that this is a line in 21 centimeters, which, uh, as you know, when you switch on your radio, you produce 21 centimeter radiation. When you look up in the sky, the sky is dominated by all sorts of uh, radiation in the same frequency. The CMB, luckily, is the, f is the foreground. So we look up in the sky. If we had microwave eyes, we would see a fireball. Okay, that would be cool. But now, for these uh, 21 centimeters, unfortunately, we are overwhelmed by uh, galactic and uh, our own planet as foregrounds. So it's extremely hard. We haven't even measured the monopole. We haven't even done like Penzias Wilson right, uh, part of this. But if you could measure it, then imagine all we know about cosmology and you can do better by a factor of thousands. Okay? So I just want to point it out because I think humanity has the potential to access this information. I don't know if in our lifetimes, if in 30 years, 50 years, but it's good to know that it's there. So this is another motivation. And, uh, well, maybe, maybe finally the, the last motivation uh, might resonate with some of the stuff. from the previous lectures is that we want to understand how quantum gravity works in expanding universes. I mean, ultimately, quantum gravity, if it's ever going to touch base with observations, it should tell us something about the beginning of the universe. And uh, I, I like this uh, plot where here in this axis, there is some vague notion of understanding. And uh, here, the cosmological constant is negative. We understand the situation very well. You have this asymptotically ADS space-time, and you can study, you can study, I don't know, like some, you have some wave packets, you throw them in, and then stuff happens, you put some detectors, you measure them. Uh, so you can study these types of questions in asymptotically ADS uh, space-times by uh, trading this question, even like quantum gravity, by a question in quantum field theory, this gauge gravity, ADS, CFT duality. So this, I would say, is uh, our best understood example. Then when the cosmological constant is zero, then we have these, um, we can study these uh, S matrices. Uh, we know quite a bit about S matrices, uh, way more than we know about cosmological correlators. So here we have a gauge gravity duality. And its most glorious form is ADS CFT. Uh, here we have, you know, S matrix theory. We even know some uh, S matrices that have nice UV properties. Uh, now there, you're, you're going to learn about these uh, interesting new developments of celestial amplitudes and so on. 
I think this is not as well understood as, uh, uh, as ADS, but clearly much better than in the case of uh, asymptotically the sitter spaces. So, so we have these asymptotically the sitter space. We would like to, for example, know how to probe what happened at the very uh, early universe by doing some measurement of cosmological correlation functions, like uh, statistics of density perturbations. And I'll show you in these lectures that at least until a few years ago, we didn't even know how to compute three level stuff, like simple stuff, okay? Never mind uh, complicated like loop diagrams or non-perturbative results. Now we made some progress, but I, I still claim that this is poorly understood. But, it's, but this whole thing still gives us inspiration. The idea that you should ask questions in the own shell type of questions or questions in the uh, asymptotic regions of space-time, it still gives us guidance of how to proceed for this type of um, problem. And I'll show that it's, uh, this conceptual point turns out to be practically useful for computations. Okay. I mean, ultimately, we would like to understand if there is some uh, alternative description, some dual description. Maybe there is a set of questions that you ask here, because it's really what we observe. Okay, so it's also guided by experiments, if you wish, because this is really the only thing that you have access to. Uh, but also, it resonates with the whole holographic principle. And ultimately, if we understand these questions well, we'll be able to uh, maybe say something about the beginning of the universe. Of course, would be fantastic. Okay, so I hope by now you're excited to learn about this stuff. So I'm done with the motivation, and I'll start the lectures, like salt of the earth, like formulas. And, uh, yeah, question. Hey, question. This time that you have there on the right, is this time with respect to which which time is it? Ah, it's like cosmic time. If you foliate space time with some FRW slices, it's just like a, some naive uh, timekeeping. It's just that here we can observe things at different redshifts. So you see the galaxies. Uh, there, there is a clear notion of time that there are a bunch of galaxies that look that are further away from us and so on. Of course, you can't measure the flow of time on all of these scales, but uh, it's easier. No, so there's this whole void that you can't really tell, and then you can see the CMB, right? And that's the earliest snapshot that you have. I mean, for example, people dream that we'll be able to measure a stochastic background of gravitational waves, and uh, they could either, either come from inflation, so it will be another diagram. So this is the diagram coming from scalar density perturbations, but you could imagine that the graviton would leave a non-trivial two-point function, so these, uh, these of course, you'd be, you would uh, be able to measure directly, and they would the free stream from the beginning of the universe. So this would give you access directly to time equals zero. But that's why I started dashing the line here, because here there's already modeling. Here there is modeling, but you're, you're really seeing the photons travel. They trace the whole universe. They travel through a potential well from the moment they are emitted all the way to us. And we model all this physics, and it predicts these uh, curves beautifully. So that's why we think it's right. But that's the only way we check that this is the, the right picture. But it's more tangible, if you wish. Uh, but it's, it's vague. Uh, What's the dynamics we consider for the region where the model is active? Sorry, I don't understand the question. What, what is the dynamics that are? Ah, because uh, we have a standard model of cosmology called lambda CDM. Right? So you add in uh, dark energy, dark matter, ordinary matter, these initial conditions, and you solve Einstein's equations in this uh, messy universe, and you get these curves. That's what I mean. So the, just like the standard model of particle physics has uh, you know, 18 parameters, you measure, do 18 experiments, and then you make predictions. Here we... Um, we have uh, six parameters, two coming from the initial conditions, the amplitude and scale dependence of density fluctuations, the amount of uh, ordinary matter, the amount of dark matter. Um, 
sorry, the, the amount of dark energy. Um, yes, the, the amount of dark matter, the amount of uh, dark energy, the amount of ordinary matter, and uh, some astrophysics coming from the fact that the universe is sort of opaque. It's not entirely transparent. Um, so you have six numbers that you, if you fit, you can fit this curve with these six numbers, and they must predict this curve, and it, uh, it pins it down on the nose. It, all, it, all, it also predicts other curves. So as I said, you, you, you don't have just temperature of photons. So photons have polarization. You can study correlation functions of polarization of photons. So they predict all sorts of curves, and with these six numbers, you fit everything. Modulo the three sigma here and there, and the, the, the Hubble constant is here. The Hubble constant now, and this uh, is, uh, I'm sure you must have heard that there's some discrepancy between measurements done much later and measurements coming from the early universe. It's like a order of a few percent discrepancy, but the claimed error bars are now so small that you can claim five sigma. But, okay, don't like I don't think so. Here, from, from here on, it's GR plus a bunch of uh, fluids. Of course, there's dark matter. Oh, now we're having a bar conversation. I don't have anything uh, meaningful to say. There's like dark matter. There's like a... There's a galactic rotation curves. Maybe gravity is modified. But we think that here it's like a classical field theory, maybe some thermodynamics with these initial conditions. Quantum mechanics really comes in here. The theory is weakly coupled, so we can do things meaningfully. Here, ultimately, there might be like a, some crazy quantum gravity story. But uh, here, where I'm hoping that we'll the focus of the lectures, I think we can do computations reliably because we're weak coupling, but it's cool because it's still a quantum mechanical process in some curved background. Okay. Just for curiosity, you told like that pi like some scale, like and you told there is uh, some fluid that you consider that you think is like what is that? Um, well th that's the model agnostic perspective. <laughs> now if you postulate that what drives inflation is a scalar field then the typical amplitude of the fluctuations of this scalar field will be controlled by that f pi value. But then once you put in a model, the, this f pi will be written in terms of other quantities, the Hubble parameter, the time variation of the Hubble parameter. I'll work out as, like the simplest model of inflation and you'll see how these, uh, how these things work. Okay, so uh, okay, motivated for a long time. My first lecture, which would be the next 10 minutes, I would do cosmological perturbation theory and describe the power spectra and pose the problem of known Gaussianity. I can't even say these three words in 10 minutes, so of course that's uh, too ambitious. Uh, but I'll, I'll just tell you what I plan to do. And then um, for the next lecture, I, I wanted to tell you a bit about the phenomenology of known Gaussianity, which is really about probing interactions of density fluctuations. And this idea of seeing the universe as some cosmological collider experiments. Then I want to show you how, for the past um, 15 years or so, we go about doing these computations by bulk perturbation theory. And I'm sure I'll convince you that it's pretty hard. Okay? Uh, so then that, that, uh, the fact that it's hard, even for simple processes, asks, uh, like, uh, or I don't know, begs for a better method. Is there a way? of doing things uh, more efficiently. And that's where this whole idea of bootstrap comes in. Okay? So that would be the first uh, half, or, or at least for today. And tomorrow I want to work out an example of this uh, bootstrap in cosmology. In the sitter space, very symmetric, not very good for phenomenology. But there's a lot of beautiful mathematical physics there. And uh, maybe I'll say something about spinning particles also. Then Wednesday, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, it, it depends on uh, how things are going. Uh, I, yeah, I, I really want to tell you about some uh, work that is unpublished, so I, I hope we'll get there. All right, so that's the story. Any more questions about this motivation? Okay. So let me... Wednesday, out of curiosity, 
Um, well, if you if you wish, let me make the parallel of celestial holography. Celestial holography. My understanding is that you have zillion scattering amplitudes. You re rewrite them in the celestial basis, and that gives you theoretical data to try to figure out what are the rules of this uh, celestial hologram. I think in the Cedar CFT, there is one proposal for Vasiliev gravity. But then the bulk theory is so crazy that it's hard to gain any intuition. Maybe it's just a very complicated way of rewriting free field theory. Okay. Uh, now our hope is that if we compute enough simple things, that we'll also gather enough data. The problem is that even the even the raw data, the S matrix, we don't have that. So we need to even compute the data to then try to infer what are the rules for. But okay, there, there was a, an interesting new development around uh, maybe a year ago in which uh, people understand the implication of causality and unitarity. Um, if you wish, the analog of the existence of, uh, of an OPE or, or positive spectral density in the sitter. So that now exists. Uh, maybe it was buried in the very old literature, but uh, now it exists and it's sharp and it hasn't been used yet to bootstrap something new, but um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's uh, the status, I would say. There's one concrete model of the SCFT, but then the dual theory is of the city of gravity, so it's very hard to, yeah, very hard to gain intuition from what's going on in the bulk. The causality, unitarity thing, is that not theory dependent at all? Well, there are certain things that are, uh, that are general in the sense of, uh, for example, uh, if you take a four-point function and you rewrite it in spectral form, the spectral density must be positive. Um, or there are cutting rules. So, we, uh, okay, you have to hand me a theory, but then once uh, I, I have the theory and I write the perturbative expansion, I should be able to check some cutting rules that relate different uh, orders in perturbation theory. So these, even the simple thing, like Kutkowski rules, like stuff from the 50s, 60s, like this is from two years ago. So it's very very primitive so we're like 50 years behind I give you the the thing that uh, uh, would be a dream uh, for me at least in in flat space if you scatter four gravitons if you've never seen this formula you must tonight open Tazi lectures of Cliff Chung and see this formula if you scatter uh, four gravitons if you don't know what this is, oh no, you learned today, right? I mean, the fact that you can get this formula in like five minutes, to me, is like uh, fascinating, right? If you look at the Witt's paper, which he tried to do bulk perturbation theory, it's, uh, it's a mess, right? And now you can do it in like five minutes over on the napkin. So we would like to do that in the sitter. We don't know how to do that, so that's... Uh, and this is very simple, like just a three-level GR. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, maybe we take a break now because, uh, and then I start with the, yeah. with the lecture. We take a five-minute break. And All right. Say that again?